What's going on, guys? Welcome back to the greatest podcast in the world, Shooting the Shit Uncensored. I am your host, the truth, the dad bod god, the bald, the beard, and the f- f- fucking beautiful Piers Austin. And tonight, man, we got a special one for you guys. We got a returning guest. We got the one, the only Edward Dusk in the building. I'm excited to have this conversation with Edward Dusk. It's been a while since we had him on back in 2021 in May, so just over like two years. So it's been a while. So go and check out that first episode. It was great. We had a great conversation, and this one's just gonna, This one is going to be just as good. So go and check them both out. But before we get into it, you know I need to take a quick second to tell you about our sponsor, and that is Sleefs.com. That's S-L-E-E-F-S, Sleefs.com. Now, listen, if you or someone you know is an athlete, you've got to go and check out Sleefs.com. All of their products are absolutely amazing. They've got the best athletic gear and wear in the market. They've got armbands, compression pants, compression shorts, headbands, boots, mouth guards, and they've even got those dirty boxes that you know I'm always damn rocking. So listen, go and check out those dirty boxes. Use that promo code MWAPOD to get a 10% discount in your final purchase. Now also, Wherever you're tuning in, if you are tuning in on YouTube, please like, share, subscribe, hit the bell to stay notified. I appreciate that shit. And please help us subscribe. We're almost at 1,500. We're gunning for that 2,000. Hell, we want to hit 3,000 subscribers by the end of the year. So do us a favor, hit that subscribe button, hit that share, like all that good shit. Also, if you're listening on a podcast platform, Spotify, iTunes, wherever, please make sure you hit that subscribe button, hit that follow button, and please give us a five-star review. It helps with our analytics and it helps us bring more amazing conversations to more amazing people. So get to clicking and get to tapping in because you know you're, we're bringing you some of the best conversations in professional wrestling, MMA, boxing, comedy, music, you name it, we are bringing it. But without further ado, we're about to bring it right now with the one, the only, Edward Dust, baby. <laughs> What's going on? Welcome back to Shooting the Shit Uncensored. This is the truth, Piers Austin, and I am with one of my favorite people in the entire world, and I know I say that about everyone, but this time I actually mean it. Edward Dusk, welcome back to the podcast, brother. Thank you for having me, my friend. Man, I am excited to have you back, man. I think the last time we spoke, man, as I said, the intro was like two years ago, bro. So, like, obviously, we've spoken, like, you know, off air here and there uh, in between then. But this is uh, the first time having you back in two years, man. And I'm excited to have you on, man. Thank you for giving up your time, bro. I appreciate it. No, happy to come back. It was a good chat last time. It was, um, I think the pot itself was pretty long, but I know we had a bit of, a bit of a ramble pre and post that kept us a bit engaged for quite some time. So it's good to be able to have a chat while we're both not going um, cabin crazy, stuck in lockdown. Yeah. A hundred percent, man. It's crazy to think how we were living back then and like, and it, how it wasn't that long ago, but how mm. like people now just look at COVID where it's like, you go in and it's like, <coughs> oh, what's wrong? You sick? You got the flu? No, nah, I just got COVID, man. You know what I mean? Like people don't give it, like really care about it anymore. Uh, which was, you know, when, once you kind of get, you know, your vaccines and everything and everyone develops, you know, a strength to it. It always kind of goes the way, not the wayside, but you know what I mean? I mean, there's still obviously serious cases. I know plenty of people, my wife included, that have got like long COVID that's just really ruined them. Yeah. Um, I, d- I don't think she's been able to like breathe deeply for like two years. 
Wow. Seriously. Yeah. So it definitely is um stuck around. Thankfully, yeah, we're at a point now where it's not as um I mean, I'm speaking rather uneducatedly here. I haven't kept up with it much in, in the last year, but sure. at least doesn't appear to be as deadly as it was, you know, two years ago. Um yeah. But it is weird. It's weird how we're definitely, you know, we're changed on the other side of it. It it was it, it amazed me how like so many conspiracies came out about it. You know what I mean? Like, and everyone was like, you know, and but the thing is, well, like when you saw people like protesting and like just abusing police and throwing ink bombs and stuff like that, it's just like, like, you know what I mean? Like, I think that that's, that comes when people are just sort of locked away for, for long periods. Oh yeah. With everyone, some of us, you know, some people, you know, developed new hobbies, you know, some people, focused on you know fitness or whatever it was yeah. other people went insane it's just what happens i guess when you're stuck inside you got to pick something to fill your time and some people chose weird rabbit holes of conspiracy nonsense yeah 100 percent, man i just me and my wife we had a baby <laughs> there you go but you know what it, it, it's so funny because like he was born what two years ago so 2021 in the like end of april so i think he would have just been a like a newborn when we spoke and mm. like he we were in lockdown so he was born and then two weeks after his birth complete lockdown for five months wow so he had very little interaction besides like me my wife and his siblings mm. So when after, when he was like five months old so when he, you're, you're like five month old six month old you're a little they're a little bit more alert and like we would take him out and like take him to like the local Westfields and he's like in the pram and he's just like like he just yeah. had this look of like what the fuck like you know what I mean because he's all existing no concept yeah in four walls like essentially you know what I mean so mm. in that one bubble so it was so crazy to see that but yeah he he took a while to warm up to people too because he just wasn't used to it yeah of course you know so it's crazy man but you know it's good that we're back now because now it's like you know wrestling shows are more prevalent um you know and I think people are sort of getting back uh, out there and I think honestly now shows are getting more people to them and i said this before like when we were in like lockdown is like the wrestling fans will now want to that didn't go to shows before will now be like you know what i want to go to a show now because i'm not locked down and i can go to one you know what i'm saying right. like absolutely i think you've got that as well as um you almost get to expose not i guess a second wave but I'm sure there's plenty of people that like pre lockdown might have never watched wrestling. Mm. And when you've got all the time in the world to watch anything, might have tried it for the first time, might have tried to get back into it after, you know, time away, all kinds of things. Um, mm. But you're absolutely right because it becomes, I think, live events in general, you know, like um, football attendance, you know, just live sport, mm. you know. You everyone talking about how hard it is to get, you know, tickets to like Taylor Swift concerts and stuff because like the demand is so high. Right. Yeah. Um, I think I'm very sure every show that MCW has run since coming out of lockdown and like running with frequency yeah. has sold out before a match got announced. Really? So like the demand for like the audience and that's like a 600 people. Um, See, that's also good branding as well from a company. Oh, to you know what I mean? Like, that's kind of like what, you know, I'm not saying like comparing MCW to WWE, but it's like that's kind of like what WWE can do. Like, they can sort of, like, to a certain extent they could, you know what I mean? Like, just say, hey, we're putting on a show. People want to go see it because it's a spectacle. And I think when you can achieve that before you can announce any matches, that means the company mm -hmm. is so over with the audience that they don't care who's on. They know they're going to get a great show. It's that it's creating that trust with your audience that, you know, whether you've announced matches or not, they know the, the quality that they're going to get. Yeah. And I mean, it's not just them, you know, I think a lot of companies are, especially in Australia, have gotten a lot better at the way they promote and um, build anticipation to their shows. Like I, I, I'm not featured on say PWA, but yeah. I can tell you when their shows are coming up, what their stories are, what their feuds are, even if I've missed watching the show. 
because they do such a good job of like advertising in the in the lead up to and in the fallout of each show. So you kind of know everything that's going on and building to the show and then what happens in the aftermath. And that's just because they've got such a strong social media presence. Yeah. Um, I think EPW has also gotten really good with it lately. I mean, you know, they've just done, um, I think it was 700 plus that yeah. they just did their uh, last stadium show in front of. Didn't their first so one showed, like 900? Yeah. Like, did, yeah. Like that's for like for, a, for in, like for an Australian local show, like that's massive. With, no internationals yeah is the is like the kicker there like there is that's just the epw crew mm. and then six months ago they did the 900 so in the space of six months they've done two stadium shows in front of what's that over 1500 people but you know what like i feel like necessarily like internationals aren't necessarily always a good thing for a show because it's like you look at a PWA and MCW show, like they like as you said before, MCW sold out in five minutes. Um, and, and like I think other promotions, well, like in Sydney, EWA, they've had like their first show, they had five eighty, five hundred eighty people there. Next there show you around the same, you know what I mean? Like, you, you know, when you don't need it, and I've seen show some shows that do have international talents on them, and they don't draw nearly as well. Mm, absolutely, I don't think it. I think now especially because the world is so much more accessible, like mm. whether it's through social media, whether it's through like, I can think like the, the amount of like internationals, right. We get out here now every year is exponentially more than what it was five years ago. 100%. You might say like one or two. And now like you've got uh BCW have, um, Samurai Del Sol, Lince Dorado on their show tonight. Then you've, while you've got an impact show on in the middle of Wagga Wagga, right? Yeah. <laughs> and then they're running another show tomorrow night. Like you've got impact doing a tour. Yeah. Right. That, which is in, insane to think of. Um, but it's just that I feel like everything's so much more accessible that now having like, whereas again, rewind like five, 10 years, you'd put, yeah. Chris Masters on a show, and that was enough because people were like, "Oh my god, this guy was on TV." Yeah. Whereas honestly. now, a lot of Australian talent is just on TV. Hundred percent. But you know what I think it is is as well. It's I feel it's the the one thing in wrestling is to get the crowd invested, right? That's what you want to do. You want to have the 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 crowd buy in and be invested in the product. And I think that that's what it is. They're invested in the storytelling. They're invested in the characters, the character development. And I feel like while it's good to sometimes bring in an international and sometimes it can make sense to, you know what I mean? Like you, you can integrate into a story, but it's like sometimes maybe it's the point of you just bringing in a random person and then going, they're not really integrated in the story. They're not really integrated in like the next show or the show before. And you know what I'm saying? So the, the it's like, yeah, okay, cool. So the crowd gets to see this person wrestle, but like the progression of the storylines that they're seeing on a showly basis, it's not really yeah. tying into that. You know what I mean? I think it comes back again to that, like the fact that everything's so much more accessible and that you have such a strong platform in social media now where like, I can remember going to a PCW show in ooh, 2010, 2011. Yeah. And it was um, Matt Silver, Buddy Matthews versus Danny Psycho. And at the start of the show, they played like a, like a, you know, like a hype package yeah. that told like the story of the feud mm -hmm. because there's no streaming website for me to watch this on. So I, I don't know. I've just seen that there's live wrestling on. So I've gone to the show. I've paid my money and I'm, I don't know who any yeah. of these guys are, right? Whereas now we can tell you a story on social media. Like I can have a match with someone where we set something up. And then in the two months between that and the next match, we can use social media to do promos, do vignettes, yeah. um, do whatever, where we can craft an entire story along the way. Mm. And, the, and a good portion of the fans will see it you know you want to make sure that you're still telling that story on the shows but we have such an ability to tell you so much more so to what you're saying 
is you can build a lot more of that investment now. Yeah. Whereas, you know, like when I started going to local shows and like I said, I didn't know who any of these people were because mm. unless I'm going to go on their website, order their DVD, wait for the DVD to come in the mail, watch the DVD, and then hope mm. that the roster looks anything like it did on this DVD to the show <laughs> that I'm watching that happens like six months after that show, yeah. which I did. And plenty of times you were like, man, the guy that was champion on the DVD isn't even on the show. Where is he? Yeah. Um, whereas now, yeah, you've got all these streaming servers. So I feel like, like you're saying, you can build this investment with the crowd because even if they miss out on a show, they can still see what happens. They can follow along online. They can look at stories. They can watch the stream, whatever it might be. They can miss a show, but still keep up to date. So they're still in the loop. Mm. Whereas you know, 100%. once upon a time, <laughs> it wasn't the case. And, but you know what? Like, I feel like in, in a lot of ways, there's some people that really utilize social media so well for their promos. Like, you know what I mean? Like, like I, I, I pop huge for like, you know, Zuko, who, who was on the podcast with uh, BDE the other week. Um, oh, him, right, yep. him, him and his tag partner, I honestly believe do some of the best like fucking promos around. Like their, their stuff is always entertaining. Like it's never oh. like overly too dramatic or anything like that. It's it's very lighthearted, but it's always entertaining. And it's like there's sometimes this, they're, they're a little bit more serious. Sometimes they're a little bit more funny, but they always have that entertaining value. Whereas like even from someone who, you know what I mean? Like is like involved to a certain extent can sit there and go, that's fucking good. I'm looking forward to seeing the next one. And that's kind of like, I feel like there's a few people in the Australian scene that really do promos well. And I feel like you're particularly one of them as well. Like as far as your deliverance in your promos and also what you put into them, I feel like you are one of the best promos in, in, in Australia, hands down. No, oh, thank you. I um, I will blow smoke and say that I am also one of the best. <laughs> I, have no, I have no bones about it. I know it's yeah. my bread and butter. I know, you know, the old, oh, I see you old saying, but you're exactly right. There are certain people that like utilize it tremendously, right? Um, uh, Cracker Jack is obviously one, you know, mm. he's much like myself have a part, a strong part of what our brand is, which is mm. these promos online, because they're not only just like, here's me talking about the wrestling match. It's how it looks, how it's edited, how it comes together what's in the promo like the whole package is an encapsulation of what this character is if you've never seen cracker jack before go watch a promo now you know what cracker jack is if you've never seen edward dusk before go and watch one of the promos now you know what edward dusk is you don't you might not know the full context to it but just in that little 90 second snippet mm. you can grasp the whole concept of it um James Hartness over in Perth has started doing a really good job of utilizing like promos to convey the way that he's changing his character. Now, if you follow that stuff, like it's such an easy thing that you can utilize, especially if you can get like whatever promotion you're working for behind you to post it, you know, on their channels and their um, pages. Yeah. And it's such an easy thing to do. Like you're saying, you know, you see it and now you're invested and now you want to go see the see the show you know whereas a lot of people will have a huge match you know a great opportunity against a, a an international opponent or a big name opponent or a a championship match or a big match in their feud etc cetera, etc cetera. and all the and all they can lend to it is sharing the match graphic on instagram and going tonight and it's like you're in this big opportunity and the only thing that you can bring yourself to give to this is to mm -hmm. go tonight. This is happening today. Like <laughs> obviously yeah. the dates on the graphic, like that's why that's there. So people know mm. you, you don't want to like cut a promo because I mean, I don't know if a lot of people realize, but I mean, for, uh, for most of us, right. The goal is signed, right. Yeah, to some, to, or to do this for a living, whether it's on the independence, whether it's on a WWE, AEW, Impact, right? Mm. But what you see on a lot of those people, uh, sorry, what you see people do on all these platforms is 
cut promos. Mm. I mean, Matt Cardona is a great example, right? He's just working perfect independence. Example. Yeah, perfect example. Oh, but for every, almost every match, every story, there's videos, there's promos, whether it's something he shoots backstage real quick or mm. something that he puts money and time and production into, he's creating content, right? So you're up to date with everything he's doing. Um, if you look on TV, you've got promos, you've got vignettes, you've got promo segments backstage, promo segments in ring. And you've got all these things that it's such a strong, huge portion of what we do. And yet it's so many people just go, nah, I won't do that. Yeah. Or, you know, I didn't get asked to make one. Oh, I didn't get time to cut a promo. It's like, well, we'll just do it. You, it. Like that. But I feel like that's one of those things where it's like you should, or like that that's one of those things like you have in your control where it's like, you might not be able to go and train and take bumps every day, but you can easily go and stand in front of a, a ring light or like, you know what I mean? Yeah. You know, and go record a promo or go and practice a promo and, and stuff like that. And, and even now, like with, with what I'm doing with um, Vinnie Vane and Banks is like with our sort of stuff, we're trying to get together like before a show and do mm -hmm. a promo and then straight after the show do a promo. So it's like, okay, what's next for us is what we cover in that next promo. And then we sort of have the build up to the next show and then the, the end of that show, like what actually happened. So like telling the story each time that we're going out and you know what I mean? Like that's what it's, we're trying to do. And there's, you know, and you can have people that might say like, you know, Oh, maybe not it's the company's fault that's not the right phrasing but you could make the argument that maybe promotion should make more of an effort to like get those things from people and that's fine like uh, for instance wrestle rampage right my second home at the end of every like, on the run sheet is a list of the promos that are needed mcw yeah. do it as well um i'm sure other promotions do but as the for the ones that i work for Mm. On those run sheets um, at Rampage and MCW, there is promos from da 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 da, da, da. and you'll have um, the cam um, for Rampage. It's the same guys that film the show. Yeah, they then come backstage afterwards, and they have their list, and they find everyone and get those promos recorded, so everyone can have the good quality recording footage ready to go. Um, it's um and mcw is the same right we've got our uh the production team there and same thing you go find them there's a whole room dedicated it uh the ballroom stuff's a great example everyone did the tumble um wheel ball promos so you've got everyone coming in to do them so they're there mm. so you don't need to go and find them which is great because it's an easy way to make content and again something that like every promotion should do um but it is also, again, like you're saying, what you and Vinny do is going to that effort to go, right, let's do this, let's do this, let's do mm. this. And that way we've got them. And if mm. they want them, they're ready to go. And if they don't want them, we could use them. Or, you know, we might never need them. But it's better to have it than not have it. But I, I think as well, like, it, it, it's, you know, in living in such a um, qu quick digestible social media thing, like with TikTok, like those quick one minute to two minute videos is so key. And I like, that's the kind of like promos that I like, I think is so important. Like, especially when you're putting them on social media, like to keep, like I try and like keep two minutes as, and as, like, I think that's a kind of a good time, but like, I feel like sometimes if you go over that, as long as you can keep it captivating and entertaining and you can keep like your audience engaged, it doesn't really matter, but like, I think if you can do it quick and precise and to the point, you, you know, you're getting much more engagement on, on your uh, promo from it though. What do you think? Oh, absolutely. There's literal research you can look, look at that. Like the longer a video gets on like a, it's different on say like a YouTube now where like that platform has moved to almost like TV. Yeah. You know, 100%. you've got so mine is littered with like, um, like analysis videos of like books and, and movies and, and things like that. that are and, like the 30. And, and the Piers Austin podcast as well, of course. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> so they, and like, but that, you know, if you put your podcast up on something like a Facebook and you just posted an hour long video or got Twitter blue and did the same thing, yeah. I don't know how many people would interact with it. Right. 
mm. you put it on because they're apps where you want to scroll. Like that's what yeah. they're built for, right? Quick gratification. Mm. Whereas YouTube is is not that. It is the put the hour long video on, set the phone down, or set the laptop aside, and watch. You know, hundred percent. Yeah. So that's so you know that like if you're posting your promos to a to a TikTok, to a Twitter, to a Facebook, to an Instagram, if and where the runtime is displayed, and someone sees five minutes, they're just going. They'll just scroll past it, you know, unless they really want it again, like we were saying about like promotions, unless you've built an investment in people where they know that that time isn't going to be wasted, no one's mm. watching it. Yeah. Um, I've, I try and cap myself same very much like yourself. If it's over two minutes, there needs to be a reason for that. If it's over 90 seconds, really, yeah. it need, there needs to be something, whether it's a big feud, um, Maybe it's not just a promo. Maybe it's more of like a, a package. You know, it's mm. recapping a, a feud or, or something. So there's enough going on in there that you it keeps you invested in you watching. But when people yeah. post a five minute video of them standing in front of their back fence talking about a match next Saturday, what? Why would I watch that? Mm. Like you're not. There's no edits. You're not cutting to footage or anything. It's just you staring at your phone for five minutes talking and it's yeah. like why because i wouldn't i wouldn't even want that i scroll past the bathroom ones really fucking quick right <laughs> you know I mean? but i see a toilet in the background I'm like nope so like um because my wife helps me put my promos together yeah because she studied photography so that's why they all look so good and then I'll edit them together. So it's a production between the two of us. And for a while, I got a bit overboard of making them too long. Yeah. And it was her, and it's her that will be like, that's too long. This doesn't need to be there. Don't say that. Cut that out. This, sh it should be like this. And we'll, and now it's like a fine tuned machine where everything's like a minute, minute 30, because it's all it needs to be. Because again, yeah. when we're talking about TV segments, no one's getting a five minute backstage promo segment. They're all like a minute, two minutes long. Yeah. You know, because you're you go otherwise you probably change the channel or you go, oh, this is gonna go for a while. I might get up and get a drink. Whereas you lose if you're your game. in the that's it, right? If you're in the ring cutting a promo, sure you can go a bit longer because someone else might come out. You can interact physically, you can have the engagement with the crowd. There's things to keep it fresh. Yeah, but when it's just a stationary talking, that's why I say like, unless you've got like something to cut to or edit in, or you're doing a bit of a package, or maybe it's thirty seconds of me talking, then it's thirty seconds of my opponent talking, like something to keep it engaging. Eventually, no matter how good your content is, it's probably going to patter out eventually. Well, because people will just get sick of looking at you. Oh, dude, remember, what was that, seg the, the the Rock and Mankind segment? And it was like a 25-minute segment on Monday. Right. Night. And because they were kept and happening, right? Yeah, but, but, you know, it was funny. Like, like I heard, uh, like, man, like, Mick Foley turn around and said, he goes, when he got back, Vince said, that was brilliant, but never, ever do that again. Like, never go like that. He's like, just never do that again. He goes, it was brilliant. It was, it was history, but don't do it again. Another, it's, it's, it's where, like, a lot of people will watch wrestling and then when they want to learn wrestling, they watch wrestling. Yeah. And that's all they'll do. Like, I want to be a better promo, so I'll watch the good guy, the guys that do good promos. I'll go watch a Ric Flair, a John Moxley, an MJF, a Roman Reigns, right? Mm. But you can learn so much about wrestling from watching or studying anything else, right? Yeah, because you can look at something like a Quentin Tarantino is probably a perfect example because a lot of his movies just have long monologues. Mm. You know, like Inglorious Bastards, probably my favorite Tarantino film. The first like ten Agreed. minutes, agree, mm. is a is the interrogation scene. Right, nothing yeah. happens for ten minutes. They're just talking, mm. but what he does to keep it interesting is they talk for a few minutes and then the tension's cut by him going, could I try some of your milk? And so it cuts from this <laughs> discussion 
to now they're Ooh. talking about this guy's milk, like, you know, his, that he wants a glass of milk. And yeah. so it introduces something new, right? And then they talk for a bit more. And then they introduce the fact that there's the, um, uh, the guy, the Jewish people that are trying to run away from the Nazis under the floorboards. Yeah. Right. Like as the scene goes on, they introduce you things to keep you engaged. And if you watch almost any Tarantino film that have those long scenes, it's the same yeah. thing. It, you the know what? It's, was- it's the same as with uh, the hateful eight. Remember the scene when uh, I'm trying to think who it is. Um, uh, I can't remember the name of the actor, but he's walking around and he's talking and it was like right near the, fi- I think it was, might've been the final scene when they have the big shootout in the house and he kind of finally puts it all together. And it's like, you mm. see the the camera spanning and, and the intensity of it. Like each thing, it was like, almost like it was a fucking build. Right. So it started building, building, building. And it was just like, Oh shit. Now it's about to pop off. <clears throat> and that's it. You just, You've got to have something to keep people engaged. Otherwise, it doesn't need to be that long. Nah. I mean, there's nothing wrong with, you know, like like I said, I've made plenty of long promos. When I um, when I wrestled Royce Chambers, um, and we had a big, we were the main event, we were the title match. I think the promo I put together was like three minutes long because it was recapping like this this feud that we'd had and this history that we had together. And then I made sure to have bits of the promo where it would cut to footage. So even though I was just talking about what would happen, rather than just look at me, explain it to you, yeah. I will narrate what was happening, but here's the match that it happened in, mm. you know, so you can watch it all happen because that way it's more engaging. If I sit there and go, Oh, remember this show where you beat me, you know, I was really upset about it. It's like, yeah. okay, sure. But if I can sh- cut to the footage, where the match is happening and then he hits me with his finisher and he beats me. And then after the match, I show you the shot of where I look devastated because I've lost. You go, Oh, this actually all happened. Oh, okay. I did. I missed that show, but now you're caught up because you're watching because you want to see these beats happen. Yeah. But again, like you're saying, if it's just some dude standing in his bathroom for five minutes, I'll probably just keep scrolling. But you know what as well? Like, I think it really takes a lot of time to really, understand because i feel like most wrestling fans probably see like and then and like i think everyone before even people before they even get in the business and, and cut a real promo i think everyone at some stage has cut a promo in their car or in the bathroom <laughs> no one's over in the shower right but i feel like to do it and do it well is a fucking art form like it really it really is like when you i've actually had to like start to figure out how to do it i'm like this is fucking ridiculous how difficult this can be it's I think the best way to put it is um, Christian Cage was on uh, Swerve Strickland's podcast. Yeah. Which is a really good podcast, actually. I've only just recently started checking it out, but he was talking about what makes his promos so good because the man is phenomenal at them. I'll sing Christian's praises forever. Um, Is he just says that you've just got, got to believe what you're saying. You know, whether mm. you're a baby face, whether you're a heel, you need to believe it. And it's where, again, you can kind of feel it. You know, you can, whether you, you know, if you're the bad guy and you're saying all these awful things, a lot of people, I think, hold back because they're worried that someone will think they're actually a bad person mm. or that they might upset someone if they say something. And I think... I have an, I definitely feel I have an advantage in that the character that I have is very much like larger than life. Yeah. You know, like Edward Dusk is not a person you see on the street. No. It's just, it's just not right. So I can do and say the things that I say because it's not real. Mm. I don't, there might, there's always, I'll rephrase what I was trying to say. It's not real, but the emotion that's behind it is mm. it's just not the it's a same. Per- it's a performance but it's like you know what i mean like i i feel and i and, and i've said this before and we've i've had this conversation many times before about you know wrestling um how it's sort of viewed by its audience where you look at other sort of 
you know, media or entertainment platforms, whether it be stage plays, music, movies, television. And uh, like, it, it really comes down to like the fans really treat this business in a different way. And even in the sense, it's like, if you go and do a promo and you say something that, you know, let's say something, you know, you it may not be a hundred percent politically correct, or it might be a little bit pushing that line. It's like straight away that person is a bad person where it's like, well, they're playing a heel. Like you got mad at something a heel said. Well, they did their fucking job, right? There is always like, and there's always like boundaries, of course. Like that goes without saying. And I'm not saying people should go out there and say racist or homophobic. No, I mean, that's, that's like the logical like boundary, right? Yeah. But like um, you see it on Twitter all the time where someone will cut a promo and then like the, um, echo chamber of twitter decides that it was too much yeah and it's like i dare say that this promo was talked about between them and i've been in the situations where a baby face has gone oh say this about me say that say that yeah. or i'll say like what if i say something like this and they're like no 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 go harder say this yeah you know and then so i might go out there and say something and someone in that crowd's like oh well, that he can't be happy that Dusk just said that. And it's like, he told me to. Yeah. Uh, and, and, but you know what? Like, I like that's one of the things I've always found. Like, I've always said, if I'm going to cut a promo and I'm going to say something about someone, I'll go up to them and say, hey, I'm going to say this. Are you cool with it? And if they say really? no, then I'll go work something out. But like every time no one has ever said, don't say that. Like they've given me something else. Like, yeah, you said. It's like, because everyone it's, wants to see the best performance. Or guess the it's better no show. different to putting a match together you know right. you're not just going to hit someone with a move because you feel like it you probably talk about it beforehand and sort it out and then go out there and execute and mm. promos are no different but it is it just comes back to you've got to be believable and i think that it comes it's more than just saying the words you know because again you've got to like believe it's the it. deliver it's the delivery of it as the delivery it's the del- of the value, it say. can be, I mean. but it also like I think people can like miscue being able to perform mm. for like believability, right? Um, a, like you can look at people who weren't necessarily good promos. Mm. Like for perfect example, I reckon is Eddie Kingston in oh. the realms of a is a, of a professional wrestling promo terrible. He what? Just yelled. No, no, trust me. Oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. If you look at the way, like, other greats, like a Rock, a Hogan, uh, a Shawn Michaels, a Triple H, a Ric Flair, how they cut a wrestling promo, mm. nothing like what Eddie does. Eddie doesn't wait for the fans to react. He doesn't have beats. He doesn't have catchphrases. He just goes out there, rambles and yells and gets his point across, right? Yeah. By what a lot of people view is wrestling promo, he doesn't do any of it. Mm. But the minute I say he's not a good wrestling promo, you immediately go, yes, he is. Yeah. He's, but it's not, it's not because he's a good actor. It's not because he's a good promo. It's because he believes it. Mm. Everything he says, he believes. He doesn't need a good cadence. He doesn't need to be well-spoken. He doesn't need to have cool quips or good lines. He just goes out there and talks. And because he believes it, you believe it. That's what makes it a good promo. Because anyone can go out there with a good script, a good catchy insult, and a good uh, go-home catchphrase. Doesn't make it a good promo. Yeah, no, 100%. Correct. You can have all the things that make a good promo, it's why a lot of people go back and watch some of like your old promos and you know, like if you look at where like you could make an argument that a lot of the people that were good talkers back when it was big rah rah wrestling promo yeah. are terrible promos now. Like if you go and watch like the Road Warriors, they scream nonsense for two minutes. Yeah. It's not <laughs> But it's the but, same. It's the same with Ultimate Warrior, right? Ultimate Warrior is like remember, like oh, you're probably a little bit younger, but I remember growing. I up remember and, Warrior. All right, so in the eighties and nineties, right, you were either a Hogan guy or you're a Warrior guy. So, like, I can remember, but it's like looking back now, it's like, 
he could barely work. Yeah. <laughs> he, he he could he wouldn't sell. <laughs> And his promos were just gibberish fucking, like, nonsense. Like, he was not the gr- greatest worker, but he, he captivated you. Like, he had it's, that it's a different. It's a different kind of believe, right? But mm. you believe him, right? Yeah. You don't know see. why, but he's committed. You don't know what's going on, but he is committed to what he's doing. So you, by proxy, believe him. Mm. It's why, like... You can have someone go out there. A, a modern example might be like a Dan Housen, right? Utter nonsense. But because he commits to it, it it works. Mm. If he walked out there and half-assed what he does, it wouldn't work. No. And you can, look all, you can look all over the place where people do um, weird stuff and they don't fully commit to it and it doesn't work. Yeah. Another example is like a, uh, a Joe Hendry who for the most part creates funny songs about his opponent to make fun of them. That's dope. <laughs> right. Like that. That's cool. But because he launches a full blown music number with a music video, with a band and lyrics, and he can sing, it works 100%. because it it's all there. Whereas yeah. if he half asked it, it wouldn't work. Yeah. Yeah. Rock yeah. is a goofy character. He refers to himself in the third person, has 27 catchphrases, and has the insults of a 10-year-old. Well, the because people, he does it with such, like, belief, you're but into even, it. But even the people's elbow is, like, the most ridiculous move. Like, in, like it's the most stupidest shit in professional wrestling. But it fucking gets people off on their feet. Because he doesn't deliver it like it's the goofiest thing in wrestling. Hmm. He delivers it like it's the most devastating thing he has. The intensity in his eyes when he's taken off his elbow pad is more intensity than a lot of people have ever. Yeah. So you're into it. Mm. Whereas if he if he kind of hammed it up and was like, this is a bit silly, isn't it? You'd be like, yeah, it is. And that <laughs> would be it. It probably would have been a fun couple of months and we'd all be like, man, remember that time The Rock did that funny thing? Yeah. And that'd be it. But I feel like that's where, like, you know, where you look at comedy wrestling and, you know, some performers go, I don't want to be a comedy act. And it's like, well, you don't have to be, but be entertaining. You know what I mean? And, and, and like, case in point, Kurt Angle, would you call Kurt Angle a comedy act? Would you call Steve Austin or Vince McMahon comedy acts? No, but they did a lot of comedy. And it was fucking and tremendously. And yeah. did it fantastically with amazing timing. And then shortly thereafter we're able to turn it up and turn the intensity up and you know be badass killers and all that sort of shit right so you know what i mean it can be done and even like case in point you look at um our truth like his last what 10 years in wwe he's been the comedy guy with you know little jimmy and all that other shit right but he goes straight into it he's another guy like dan house and he go you know what i mean like he doesn't do it half-assed but then if you go see his shit that he did in like the early days of TNA and see what the character he was portraying back then, he was far from a, like, you know, the truth, Ron, the truth killings was far from a comedy act. You know what I mean? So I feel like just because you're putting that spot doesn't mean that that's what you are. Like there's a, having a good range. Right. Is a thing. It's, it is, it's where um, people do like comedy wrestling is a great example because you hear stories of it all over the place where someone gets given like a comedy gimmick and they hate it, mm. you know, and it's because of that. They don't want to commit to it. Um, Matt Hader, right? I don't know how much of his stuff you've seen, but for a guy who has been like the top dude in RCW for like three years, I want to say two, three years. So he's like in their main events, he's their top baby face, right? Which is, a role that a lot of people would love to have a sure. good portion of what he does is comedy, mm. but it's because he can do the comedy, but he can do the the serious. Mm. So when it's time for him to be funny, he gives it everything because then you believe it, you invest in it and it makes it enjoyable. And then when it's time for him to flick the switch and be serious blood feud main event baby face matt hater he can flick that switch mm. make you believe it and make you invest in it um gino mr juicy and mcw another great example was a bit of a comedy character for the longest time 
was a mm. funny baby face, but committed to it. So it worked. And then when he turned heel and became this absolute monster killer again, because he gave it so much, he was mm. the most terrifying thing, you know, being the world champion for like a year, I think when like the year before he was running around in a KFC bucket singlet, getting his <laughs> ass out. Yeah. And all that changed was the way he was carrying himself and the way he was believing who he was. Mm. And it's where a lot of people hear you're going to do comedy and they go, Oh, I don't want to do that. When it's, it's so easy. I did um, a match with gorgeous Greg at wrestle rampage. Who's entire, he's a very big guy. He comes out to simply the best throwing flower petals. He's got a big <laughs> cape awesome. robe, a big yeah. blonde wig. You know, he's the epitome of like a flashy comedy wrestler. And we yeah. had a comedy match. I didn't do any comedy. The most I did was I got um I kicked he took a drink of um water because he was gassed. Yeah. And then I got sick of it, so I kicked him in the stomach and he spat the water in my face and I took a pratfall, right? Yeah. I'm not doing any comedy. I'm doing me. He's doing the comedy, yeah. but we make it a comedy match because I am playing the straight man with such like because I in this moment am making you believe that I am infuriated by what the shenanigans that is going on. It's funny. Whereas I'm if I was half assing it or making it goofy, you'd be like, this is just silly. Mm. But if it, you can just make them believe in what you're doing, it works. A hundred percent. And I feel like that's where it comes down to the the point of believability. And it's like, I've had conversations with people where they talk like intergender wrestling, for example, and they go, it's not believable. And I'm like, it, well, how is it not? I go, because, you know, I mean, if it's not believable, it, it doesn't matter. It's up. It doesn't matter who's in the ring. If something's unbelievable, then that comes down to the workers, not the gender of the workers. I think professional wrestling, anything can be made believable if done right. The, the whole believability argument, of intergender wrestling is dumb. It's just dumb. Yeah. I, plenty of people will make the argument of like, why is it believable that Rey Mysterio can beat Batista, mm. but it's not believable, you know, that Charlie Evans could wrestle me, right? It's dumb though, because if you look at someone like, grab like any trained, like a Ronda Rousey, right? Easy, mm. easy grab. She could mop the floor with a probably a million men without breaking a sweat because 100%. she is a world class trained fighter. Mm -hmm. Not because it's not because she's big, not because it's believable, but because she can fight, right? She's a trained sure. killer. Maybe, you know, it, it's the WWE that like the only women that could wrestle the men are like your Chinas, your Beth Phoenixes, and your Awesome Kongs because they're big women. When in reality, that's not how fighting works. Like, go watch the beginning of UFC when, like, a tiny Royce Gracie mopped the floor with everyone. Yeah. Because yeah. he was just a more skilled fighter. 100%. And, like, no one said it wasn't believable either. Because they saw it happen. The only reason why people get into this argument of, our oh, intergender wrestling isn't believable is because they themselves don't want it. And this feels to them like a good argument without them needing to outwardly say that I'm a complete bigot who just won't respect that women can also wrestle good. Yeah. I mean, look, to me, I look at it at saying, well, look, women and men wrestling each other, like it's not something that I really am that against. You know what I mean? Like it's not something like I would die on a hill over, whereas I look at it as like, I've seen good matches. I've seen good intergender matches where it is believable. And I've also seen really bad, you know, men wrestling each other and women wrestling each other where it has looked like shit and hasn't been believable. So mm -hmm. I, I, like I said, I, I stand by what I said earlier. And I've said before is like, if it's not believable, it comes down to the workers, not the gender of the, those two people. No, because it doesn't just extend to size or gender, right? Because it could just lead to uh, the easiest example is if I work a match and I work someone's leg the entire match, right? So we're telling you the story that his leg is injured and then it comes to the comeback 
and they're running around on that leg. They do their springboard. They do a hurricane rana. They're popping up, you know, come on, make some noise. And that knee is fine. Your believability out the window. Cause you're like, so I just invested in your knee injury for 10 minutes. And in the last five minutes, you told me that it didn't, didn't matter at all. Yeah. So what, what are you telling me now? Because I thought you couldn't, you couldn't walk before, but now that it's time for your comeback, you're fine. Yeah. You're fine. Well, there's up. my believability gone. Mm. Whereas you're going to be much more invested in a baby face who, if they have their leg injured the entire match, and then they make the comeback on one leg because they're wounded it's it's much not it will make you believe in it a lot more because you'll get swept up in that because that is a human emotion that you see someone in peril overcoming it and you want to root for them yeah. so you become more invested yeah and you you you've got that sort of but also as well like you have the person still sort of fighting through that pain and you get the person more in, in, in involved more engaged in it because they are sort of getting that underdog and want to see him or to see her be successful in that moment and mm -hmm. That's a prime example of that. And and even when like you, you and you do see on shows where sort of like people do go to make a comeback and there's like the whole point of like that working that leg or working the back. And now the person's like a hundred like I remember watching an NXT show where like it was a, a, a ladder match and it had like six of them in this ladder match a couple about a year or two ago. And I had this conversation with someone, and they said, "Oh, that was one of the greatest ladder matches of all time." I said, "No, it fucking wasn't." And they go, "What do you mean?" And I said, "Prime example. What's the whole point of a ladder match?" And he goes, "Well, to get the belt from up the top, or the, to to get the thing." Okay, great. So, how come one of the competitors climbed all the way to the top, and instead of going for the belt, decided to fucking pose and do self serving shit? Mm. And and you know what I mean? Like, not the place for it. Because why would you do that when you just go? And one like, and even I know that was not part of the story, but it's like that point is useless because you've just exposed how ridiculous that is because that person was able to stand there for an inordinate amount of time to, to strike a pose, you know? Absolutely. And like, you know, you can always make the argument, like, you know, you can make an argument for a lot of things, but you need to, it comes back to like making it believable, right? Yeah. Um, if you had like a character that, you know, would like if you had a very egotistical, narcissistic character who climbed the ladder and it would be like and they took a moment to go i'm gonna win no yeah. one's here to stop me and then they got cut off because they get their comeuppance right or maybe they still win and that's their heat yeah. right yeah no it, it, it wasn't that it's, was a baby face that was yeah. so like in those like so that's why it doesn't work but that's where like again if you just like stop and think about it for like two seconds you could make it believable in that case, yeah, like, why would the baby face, like, stop and taunt before they try and win the match? You know, like, that doesn't make sense. But, but the funny thing is he didn't even do that. He then climbed. <laughs> so, <laughs> there you go. So there's no save in that. There's yeah, no I'm save in that. <laughs> but you would expect that at that level of, like, of a production. <laughs> You're like, yeah, maybe we pan to the crowd at that point. But that's where, like, we can take everything we've talked about with promos and you can sure. translate it over to in-ring stuff where, like, hmm. If you just stop and make that little bit of extra effort, like, you know, in promos, it can be all the production and making sure that, you know, you try and film in a good location, not your bathroom or in front of your fence or whatever. You go into the wrestling side of things and you can create, you know, a reason for something or just think about it. Like the analogy yeah. that we used of like working a body part just to throw it away. Yeah. If you know, as a wrestler, like if I turn to you and say, Hey man, what if I work your leg and you go, ah, oh, I really can't do my comeback if my legs hurt. What if, and then you stop and go, all right, what do we do? Why don't you work my arm? Yeah. Now we can tell the exact same story. It doesn't have to change at all. And then when we get to the comeback, you just have to hold, you know, you'll just sell that arm while you do your comeback. And that way you're not trying to also hop around on one leg. Take two seconds to think about it. And now you can make it all make sense. Mm. Whereas if you just like go, wouldn't it be cool if you worked my leg anyway? And then you just roll on and then throw it away with no purpose. And now it's like, like you said before, well, what was the point of me paying attention? Mm. Yeah. Like it, it's, it's almost like, well, you, you've taken me out of the realm of believability at that point. Yeah. As, as someone who's in the audience, you've taken the audience out of that realm of believability. They're going to go. Yeah. 
100%. Because if you're telling the crowd to pay attention to something and they do, and then you don't give them any reason to, they're going to, with even if they don't realize it, they're going to feel like, oh, okay, well, that didn't, you know, go anywhere. I had someone that asked me to, like, give them feedback on a match a while ago, and that was, like, something we talked about because he worked the, his, the opponent's back the whole match. Yeah. And then when the comeback came, it just didn't matter. And they had a whole finishing sequence of moves and everything. And I was like, the only note I have is like, why, what happened to the back? You told like the first three, like three fourths of the match were all about that. His back was so messed up that he couldn't get on top. And then when he did get on top, the back just disappeared. (laughs) Yeah. Well, that's 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 well. That's the thing, though. Like, I, I think it probably comes down to the more refiner part of storytelling. Uh, yeah, and I think a lot of people like it's where, like, I think as baby faces, that's like your greatest tool. You know, I think like a Shawn Michaels is a great example of it, um, or a more modern one would be like a um, a Tanahashi. Not that that's too modern; he's a bit older right. now. Um, but these people that like your vulnerability is your selling as a baby face because that's yeah. what makes people want to root for you. Mm. Whereas if you don't want to sell anything or look like you're in peril, why are people going to root for you? You know, we all know the way the superhero movies go, you know, before the third act, the superhero gets beaten up by the bad guy, gets a pep talk from their sidekick or love interest. And then they go back and at the end of the movie, they have the fight and they win. But mm. it's that dark, um, night of the soul moment that makes you go, oh man, I really hope he wins at the end. Like there was ever a chance that he wasn't going to win, but then he goes and does, right? Wrestling's the exact same thing, Mm -hmm. especially like in our market, right? Like in Japan and where it's a bit different, you could make an argument, but like here it's a morality play. And for us, that's what it is. You need that vulnerability, but everyone thinks that like it's either, as a baby face, I'm stone cold or I've got to be like a wimp. Whereas yeah. like, the, I, I shouldn't say everybody, that's a generalized statement, but that's where like people that something's going wrong is because they're either trying to be like the cool, badass tweener thing, mm-hmm. shades of gray, because <laughs> shades of gray is interesting apparently, or they they go, oh, well, I guess I'll just be a wimp and get beaten up. Like, no. Like yeah. Bret, Bret Hart is probably the person I should have named. Like watch yeah. Bret Hart get like punched in the face and his cell is like his, him refusing to fall down because mm. he's defiant. Even after getting punched in the mouth, he's like, I'm, I don't want to fall down. I don't want you to see me fall down. Yeah. So when he does, <laughs> the crowd goes, oh no, Bret. A hundred percent. A hundred percent. Like, and and that's where I think the the believability of it is is as well. Like, you know, for me, I always would see certain things like in wrestling, like when I when someone would get whipped off into the ropes. Like it, when I was a kid watching, I'd go, "Why wouldn't you just fucking stop?" <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, yes. and, and it was the same with like the ten punch and the thing. It's like, well. How come there's no blood? How come there's no bruising? You know what I mean? Like as a kid, I would sit there and I would question that and go, you know what I mean? Like I would look at it and go, I was still a fan, still loved it, but I'd go, huh, I wonder. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like that was the sort of thing where I started going, well, maybe Santa Claus isn't real. And that's why like you have the suspension of disbelief, right? Yeah. Where you've got to have like something to cover up the fact that it's, you know, it is a bit silly. Like, the Irish whip's the best example. Like, if you give someone a whip, like, you've got to make it look like you've got to give it the effort and the oomph to make it look like you have sent this person with such momentum that when they hit those ropes, they can't help but come back at you. Whereas yeah. if you give them the littlest lazy, eh, and then they run for you, it looks silly. We all know it's silly, but you could at least make the effort to make it look less silly. Yeah, 100%. You know, so you- yeah, I agree. Yeah, the ten punch I can't defend. The ten punch is fun, I guess. It's an e it's an easy thing to do. Everyone loves to count to ten. <laughs> yeah, I know. I know. I know. But like I'm just saying, as a kid seeing that, I would just look at it and go, Oh man, really? Like what what's going on there? Um man, let, let me ask you this. Like when we did speak first time, I think it was around um 
the inception of DMDU. Um, we're seeing that company take a step away. Um, I've heard many things that sort of came out about their their last show. Um, you know, not all positive. Um, what was your sort of take on it? Because you were sort of there for the from the beginning with DMDU. I'm not sure how much you were working with them near the end. Um, but what was your sort of like overall feeling um, working with them and seeing what has sort of transpired near the end? On the last show specifically? I mean, just probably the the lead up to it and, and probably, yeah, the last show. Like what was your sort of thoughts and, you know, you take well, from I know that, that a, lot of, a lot of the drama on those last ones were from there. There was two shows on. There was one in the morning or the afternoon yeah. that I wasn't there for. Um, I was just out in the city. I wasn't at the show. I wasn't watching. So everything that happened, no idea. Wasn't there for it. Only saw the backlash online after it. So can't really comment on any of it. And sure. then as for the sh the show that was on in the evening, um, I don't think there was anything. I think it yeah. was it was more just that first show um, with the table spot with um someone who was a young um a, not a young trainee a new trainee mm. um but yeah other than the fact that it happened i know nothing about it yeah fair enough i mean what was your takeaway like from from working with them and and seeing because they seem to have such a like a hot run for such a, a while um and then it sort of started to fade out pretty quick near the end i think at the start there was a there was a uh, what, what's the word I'm looking for? A vision, I guess, for lack of a better term, of of what things should should be, would be, hoped to be. Sure. Um, and then somewhere between the inception and where we're at now, somewhere along the way, something's gone awry. Mm. Um, and, I mean, there's more... Uh, I guess, uh, not drama. Drama is not the word I'm looking for. But there's more, there's a lot of murky stuff that's happened along the yeah. way that, look, I'm not someone that finds, you know, what's going on and tries to work it out. Yeah. Um, try and do my best to, I guess, look out for those of us that are there. Mm. Um, unfortunately you can't always save people from themselves. Yeah. hundred percent. At the, at the end of the day, everyone is a consenting adult. Mm. Um, and the unfortunate side of wrestling is that sometimes we're all caught in a moment where we think that we need to like, there is a pressure that's, uh, I guess we put in our own head. Mm. Mm. A good example is when I first started, I did uh, a ladder match and I was asked to do the edge spear, you know, off the ladder to someone holding um, the, it was a contract, like hanging from, like edge did at mania to, yeah. edge, uh, to Jeff Hardy. And I was petrified of it. I didn't want to, I, I don't jump off the top rope. I'm not a very um, athletic person like agility wise mm. um never have been mm. so jumping from a great height into someone into the ground especially when when edge is one of my like is my childhood hero and sure. i have heard him for years talk about that that's the moment that his neck problem started mm. was like i don't know if i want to do that but yeah. i told myself that if I say no, they won't want me anymore because then I become the guy that said no. Mm. Because and that's, how the, and that's how the business has been for years and years and years. If you say and no, it, okay. and I'm a hundred percent like with hindsight, know that if I had turned and said I'd, I'm not comfortable doing it, they would have just gone, That's all right, we'll do something else, and we would have come up with something else, and there would have been nothing else there. But you know what? Like, it's it's interesting because um, <clears throat> one of my friends, Angel, who was who was in ECW uh, back in the day, and he was part of the Baldies, and they had the whole feud with New Jack. 
And they had that spot in ECW where they were going to go off the, the top of the stage. Where it was Vic Grimes and New Jack, which caused the whole injury between the both yep, of them. Yep, that's the right. Yep. That was originally not supposed to be Vic Grimes. That was supposed to be Angel. And he told me that he went there and Paul and that said, look, we want you and New Jack to be up there and you're both going to jump off and go through the table down here. And Angel went up there and he just, and he told me, he's like, bro, I couldn't get my feeding, like my footing right. And I just went, listen, I'll do it, but you need to put a platform, like you need to go to the hardware store and get like a long plank of wood because I can't get my feet steady there. Mm. And they go, yeah, 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 we'll do it. Time comes to the show. And, and he goes, well, did you do it? And they said, no. And he goes, well, I'm not. He goes, I don't. He told Paul Heyman straight to his face. He goes, I'm not doing it. And he goes, Vic Grimes goes, I'll do it. And he went, go right ahead, big man, go for it. And he goes the same thing when he got up there. His, he lost his footing and he got scared and then New Jack pulled him. So it was yep. like he went when he wasn't ready and that's what sort of happened. And he always said to me, he's like, bro, in wrestling, hesitate, you die. Hesitate, you get hurt. Simple. And that's where like, um, but yeah, like where there was no pressure on me. No. Um, it was on and, like, it, and in in that example, like he was had the wherewithal to go, look, I'm just not, look, if there's heat, there's heat, but I'm not doing it. Okay. And yeah. that's good. And yeah, like I know that if I had said no, there wouldn't there wouldn't be heat, there wouldn't have been anything. It was just that I used the spear at the time. So naturally, what does the promoter want in a ladder match? We'll do the edge spear. I know you like edge, you do a spear, like, ah, oh, wouldn't it be great? So he's just trying, trying to help me have a he's trying, trying to, to help me have a moment, right? Um so I had my whole like, oh shit. And I'm I can remember being like Oh yeah, look, we'll 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 set it all up in the ring and we'll give it a try and then we'll see. And because that was my way of going, all right, I'm gonna go away and try and like psych myself up to do it. Yeah. yeah. Because in the moment when he pitched it to me, I was terrified. Of course. And, yeah. But that's where like I went and did it and went off without a hitch, was perfectly okay. Nothing went wrong, you know, knock on, you know, not knock on wood because it's already happened, but you sure. Know, thank you know. Thank the lucky but, stars. Well, yeah. yeah, thank the lucky stars that it did. But there was no pressure on me to do it or not to do it. It was literally just, hey, I have this idea for you. What if you did this? And I told myself, if I say no, they're going to be so mad at me because I said no. They've come up with this idea for me. You know, if I say no, they'll never want to come up with an idea for me again. They'll hate me. They won't book me. I'm over. I'm dead in the water. Yeah, Never would have happened. And that's an unfortunate side of, I think, what wrestling used to be, yeah. where there absolutely would have been heat. And someone would have said, oh, why don't you book Dusk? And they would have been like, oh, I wanted him to jump off a ladder and he didn't want to. And they would have gone like, oh, all right, it makes sense why you don't book him anymore. Whereas now, if a promoter said, oh, I don't book Dusk, and they and you said, oh, why not? And they said, oh, I didn't want to jump off a ladder. You'd be like, and? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so we're in a much better place now. But unfortunately, for a lot of people in wrestling, especially when you're new and like the dream is to be on a show, like that's all you want, right? 100%. You get into a wrestling ring for the first time and running the ropes is the most amazing thing in the entire world because you're running in a wrestling ring. And yeah. then it turns into I've taken a bump. Like I remember taking a suplex and getting up and going, can I have another one? Can I do it again? Because I was like, I just took a suplex, right? Yeah. So you eventually get to the point where you're like, you're helping at shows and you're seeing shows happen in front of you. And you're thinking, man, imagine when I get to be on a show. So then yeah. when someone turns to you and goes, Hey, do you want to be on the show? And again, I'm guarantee you it, whatever it is, this is part of someone that goes, Oh man, if I say no, I'm never going to get this chance again. When you interviewed BDE, they told the story of being offered a match and saying, we're going to turn it down because we don't feel ready, hmm. which I can tell you as someone who had his first match after three months of training, I definitely wasn't ready, but I definitely did the match. Yeah. Not because I was scared or anything, but because I was like, oh my God, a wrestling match. Absolutely. Let's go. I'm hmm. ready. I've been training for three months. Whereas I'm now I can me. like, yeah, right. Whereas now I can look back and go, oh, bro, you should have had like months more training before you ever stepped foot on an actual show mm. but 
that was just you know the way it was whereas and like bde are mature enough as people to be able to say we're not comfortable with that we're not doing that yeah. whereas not everyone has that um i don't want to say maturity because i'm not implying that saying yes is immature but we're we're all here because we love wrestling we all want to be a part of it but you know what the, the the thing i find is like and and this is something that i've been told um over the years by certain people i actually got told this by stevie richards he's like the most successful people in the business in professional wrestling are the people that don't need professional wrestling and he said like and he said that was the moment for him when he changed and he was just like once i was sort of halfway out the door he goes that's when shit started happening for me in wrestling where i started getting big moments and you kind of see that where like it was even with certain people on on all levels it's like when you don't really need need it like especially for indie work like some indie workers if you've got a good job you've got a good career you're doing this for fun you're doing this for an enjoyment so like you have less of a fear of no nah, i'm not going to do that you know what i mean like there, there's a less of a fear to do that because it's not your be all and end all where like mm. some people they put a lot of weight on wrestling which is fair enough and some people want to make a career of it and by all means that's what you should do as i get it but you know there's also having too much energy on it and i think that's where like the bde guys really sort of hammered that home in that interview that, like that conversation that we had where it's like they disconnect from it where it's on so many other levels where it's like that also can go to how they've had much success is where it's like they don't they're doing this because it's fun not because it's like they're trying to make it as a priority or career if that makes sense it does i think um I think there's like, there's, oh, I think that's like the simple way to put it. Mm. I think the but other side of it's like, 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 maybe it's like there's less of a, it's more of just the enjoyment of it as opposed to like the fear of like, oh, I'm going to get heat. Whereas like, I don't give a fuck. Like I'm here for fun. I think it's, I think it's not so much like being able to deject yourself from it. I think it's in a way not, for lack of a better term, not taking it too seriously. Like you're saying, like where everything, yeah. every decision you make is wrestling, right? I think the best way I can think to put it is you need to understand who you are without wrestling. 100%. You know, if it was taken away tomorrow, whether it's injury, whether wrestling just ceases to exist, you know, if wrestling just packs up, packs its bags up and goes, we're done. No more, no more wrestling. You need to know like who you are. Whereas if you don't have a you without that, I think that's where you get those people who get too, I don't want to say invested, but too caught up in like the nothingness of it. Yeah. Right. Like um, I had someone that asked me why I go, like why I wrestle for wrestle rampage so much because I don't win much. So what do you mean? And they're like, well, you you go over to Adelaide, you know, they book you every every show and and you lose. Why do you want to go there? I'm like, well, I don't understand. I'm like, well, wouldn't you rather go there and win? <laughs> it, it means nothing. What? Mm. What does that matter? I get to go there and get better because the talent there is incredible. Yeah. And can learn from, you know, there are people in that locker room who have been wrestling for 15, 20 years who have wrestled all over the world. Mm. Like those are incredible eyes to get you in front of. Because um, of that, I, like I got to wrestle Davis Storm, who is arguably one of the best wrestlers in this entire country. Hands down. Right? So you're going to tell me that I should have said, no, nah, I'm good. I don't want to wrestle Davis Storm unless I'm winning. Like, no. But you know what? If, if you say that sort of stuff, then you're just a mark for yourself in, in, in the biggest way because it's like, I get it sometimes, like, it's got to make sense for, like, a storyline aspect and, and things like that. Sure. You lose, like, if it makes sense. And, like, sometimes it just happens. Like, like the whole storyline, what me and Vinny have been doing, like, since I've been his manager, he hasn't won a match all year until re recently. But it's like we tell that story in promos of well, yeah. There animal. you go. So if a promoter booked you and go, all right, and I want Vinny over and you guys go, ah, hang on. No, no. Our, our story right now is that he's not winning. So he can't win. Right. At least there's a, a reason for you to be like, no, no, no. Like I can't do that. 
you know, and that's where we come back to the conversation, being able to say no is um, I was doing a, um, a story where like the idea was that I hadn't lost, mm. you know, I'm, I'm unstoppable at the moment. And they wanted to put me in a match with um, Delta, but they also didn't want Delta to lose. And we ended up doing like a non-finish thing. The and I can, yeah. Because when they came to me, like, we want to do this match, they're like, but we're not sure what to do with the finish because you can't lose and we don't want Delta to lose. And I said, why don't we just not do the match? Hmm. Or book something else. Yeah. Why book it and then go, now what do we do? Or try like, and make it a tag and then the finish doesn't you involve know, either, you, you know what I mean? Like, you can work work something out, but if if you put something together and you go, oh, I can't, it doesn't work, damn. Like if I was to be like, all right, I want you and Vinny and I want you guys to win. And you're like, oh, well, that's not our story, right? We're, the storyline right now, Dusk, is that we can't win. Mm. And I go, but I, but I want this guy to lose on this show. Whereas if you just sit there and go, no, we're not doing it. That's those people that get too caught up in it, right? Whereas yeah, it doesn't hurt to just go, well, if you want him to lose and our whole gimmick is that we can't win, what if we do this? And you pitch an idea, right? At least then it's not just, no, I'm refusing to do that because my wrestling, it's important. I refuse yeah. to budge. I refuse to, you know, take a step back. Whereas you could just go, why don't we do a double count out where they're where both Vinny and his opponent who both aren't winning matches keep mm. dragging each other back to try and get a win by count out because at least it means I won. And then it ultimately mm. ends in a big double count out. And you've got both of them on the outside. Like, no, I was so close to winning, you know, like <laughs> there you like, go. Yeah. It, but it's like, it's just having that creativeness and being, and the, and the, cause I feel like it's always going to be a no, unless you ask or unless you sort of go, Hey, what about this and stuff like that. And, you know, for, for the it's, most part, like, I, I feel like if you, if you can go respectfully and go, Hey, I have an idea and you sort of put it out there and we we're sort of talking about that, you know, prior to, to the podcast, you know, when you deal with promoters and, and stuff like that, if you can go there and say, Hey, this is the compelling idea that I have and they get invested in it, then you know what I mean? Like that's the way to be able to be able to then start getting what you're sort of wanting to get across on the show. You know what I mean? It's, a, and that's it's not something, um, politics, but that's just like putting it out there to the world. You know? I mean, that's where I think, again, like the way wrestling used to be is I think people get too caught up in the stories they've heard of like politics from like, you know, WWF in the nineties. Right. Whereas yeah. the fact is none of us are making that kind of money. You know, we're not making Bret Hart, Shawn Michaels money. So I understand that you think that this is the big, and kind of to what BDE was saying, right? Yeah. I understand that in your head, you think that's what this is, but it's not. So again, you need to be able to take that step back, not be so caught up in it, understand who you are away from wrestling to go, all right, I'm making a bit of a, a mountain out of an anthill here. Mm. It doesn't need to be um, what you're making it out to be. And if you well, really then, don't like like an idea, I mean, you can try, but at the end of the day, it's the promoter's money. It's the promoter honest. running the show. If yeah. you really want to do the idea you're doing, and plenty of people do, go go do your own show. 100%. And, you know, it's funny when I had Kasai on the other week, you know, we were talking about that sort of stuff, and he was talking about, like, certain people on shows going, oh, my character wouldn't do that. Or that doesn't make sense for my character. And he's like, and he's told me, he's like, bro, I've told people, he's like, bro, you could leave the business today and no one's going to give a fuck. Like, honestly, like you're like, the crowd's not going to realize what your character would do or say. So just like, you know what I mean? Like it's, it's different if it's like, you've got your type of character and you want to go out there and do something like Albie and Trosker and Newey pro, like, you know I mean? like that's a bit of a, a contrast, but it's like in the same sense, it's like going out there and losing a match or going out there and, and doing a spot at the grand scheme of things. Like the audience isn't really necessarily, unless they're going to every single show for the most part, but like the audience isn't going to sit there and go, man, that wasn't really part of his gimmick. Was it now? I mean, there's also, there's a benefit into knowing your character. And of if you are able to say, ah, look, that doesn't really fit my character, right? But it, like 
like any job, right? That's what we're doing. You know, it's a workplace. It is a career. It's an employee, whatever phrase you want to put to it. Um, to draw back to what I mentioned before, wrestling, gorgeous Greg, when he's a comedy character. I'm a very serious character. So by all means, I could say, well, it's not my character to do a comedy match, but he could say, well, it's not my character to do a serious match. But that so, can even be so much better as well because you aren't a comedy character. Well, that's You're and that's on- why knowing your character is important. So in that example, like, it's all well and good to shoot someone's idea down because, oh, well, my character wouldn't do that. Okay, well, what would your character do when this scenario plays out? So, for instance, with this, it what people worry about is just, who am I? What do I do? And that's it. Whereas the, the conversation should be, who are you? Who are they? And how, what happens when they come together? For instance, Gorgeous Greg's comedy, I'm not comedy. So what happens when that comes together? You have him playing the comedy character while I play the straight man. And there you go. Right? There's the match. And now it works. It ticks all the boxes we need it to tick. And you can make it work. And that's where, like, it's all well and good to go, well, my character wouldn't do that. And then you go, rather than be confrontational, yeah. again, like we keep saying, stop, take a step back and go to yourself, I wouldn't do that. What would I do? So then what you can say is, how about I do this? Yeah. Because Edward Dusk would da 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 a hundred percent. And I think that that's probably as soon as someone says my character wouldn't do or say that, I feel like that's automatically then putting up those walls. And then the other person's like, oh, fuck. <laughs> you know I mean? Like, because then it's like, but it's how you sort of said it going, well, how, instead of doing that, what about this? Or well, how about this idea? Because it's all well and it's good if you have these ideas and, and a character that you know so well that you can go, no, I wouldn't do it like that. I'd do it like this. But mm. that's that's what's important. Not just knowing your character well enough to go, I want to get my way. Because again, it's the hierarchy of things is not you you up top. That's how you communicate to the booker and where you stand on the card. And there's many things come in play. You need to look at like things as like a hierarchy, yeah? And however you want to structure it, you are never at the top. No. Because one day you will hang it up and walk away. 100%. 100%. Right. Also, You've as got well, to like, service can... the things above you before you service yourself. If all you're doing is going out there and trying to do everything for you, it's never going to end up well. No, because then people are going to sort of start sitting there going, oh, you just want to come in and get your shit in and go home straight away. It's like, you know what I mean? Like, you just want to squash squash me or, or whatever reason, you know? So it's, um, it, it's, it's an interesting take. Like, it really is. I feel like, for the most part, you know, where now, like, you know, do you, like in today's day and age in society and wrestling, right? Do you see that the character work is kind of slowly stepping away in professional wrestling? Like, I feel like now the major flamboyantly type characters, where now we live in in more of like an athletic, people are more look like athletes than characters. I feel like in professional wrestling. And I don't think that's necessarily a bad thing or a good thing. It's just something that I've really sort of noticed where it's like the characters are sort of slowly, I don't know, going a more realistic athletic athlete Maybe. type. Maybe. I mean, my immediate argument to you would be the two, the th- I guess three, now that they've made another world title, your three champions of your biggest promotions, right? In sure. Rollins, Reigns, and MJF are all huge characters. Yeah. Like, sure, when it's in the ring, they're athletic, they're athletes, you know, et cetera, et cetera. MJF is a poster child for a classic heel character. Seth Rollins is a flamboyant, colourful, outside-of-the-box baby face who you want to root for because he's different. You know, he is against the grain, right? And Reigns is your tent pole monster heel sitting on top of the mountain who no one can touch. They are like archetypes of character stereotypes. And they're sitting at the very top of wrestling. Like if you turn to like any wrestler and said, do you want to be WWE champion tomorrow? I don't know how many of them are going to say no. Of course. Those are the guys up the top and they're doing character work. It's not... It's not really the moves that get 
you know, talked about. It's their promos. Um, Rollins came out in the shield gear when he wrestled Roman, and it was the talk of wrestling for a week. All yeah. he did was wear his old wrestling attire. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. But because it's a callback to his old character, it it resonates, right? Yeah. Um, so I think in I think the, if you ask me that in like the 2000s, absolutely, because that's what Ring of Honor was. Ring of Honor like was not about yeah. characters as much as it was about pure wrestling, right? That was their brand. That's why they stood out. You know, TNA tried to do it, that that was what the X division was, you know. Yeah. But I think I think now we have a resurgence in in characters. And I think that people don't realize it as much as it is. Like, it's like the people that hate Orange Cassidy because that's not what wrestling is. When Orange Cassidy is the most wrestling wrestler that ever wrestled. Mm. His entire shtick as he's a baby an, face. He's an ultimate worker. Dude, he, he can wrestle a match with the best of them. He can cut a promo. He's got a gimmick. He's got an entrance. He's got a pose. You know, he's got everything. He's got a, an engaging, a, a way to engage with the fans as a baby face to get them invested. Because every time he does the pockets, every time he does the kicks, every time he puts on his sunglasses, there's a reaction. 100%. So you can tell me, you can say that, you know, oh, it's, it's it's not what I think wrestling is or this or that or whatever. He's more over than 90% of other wrestlers because what he's doing is wrestling. Just because it's not the wrestling you might like doesn't mean oh. it's, you know. It's like the yeah. same people that say Kevin Owens can't be a top guy because he's not like, you know, jacked or something. Oh, fuck off, but then Nick those Foley. same but then those same people will tell you how much they love a Mick Foley or how much yeah. they love a Dusty Rhodes. Mm. so explain to me how one is wrestling but the other one is not so like when you say you know that it's going away i think what's happening is we're moving away from that's hulk hogan he's the good guy because he does good things he says say your prayers eat your vitamins right and this is rick rude he's the bad guy because he's mean to people and he's very egotistical he's not very nice well, now there's, now, more, there's different layers to it now, I feel. Like there's layers to there it. There is. Because now you don't need to just go good guy, bad guy. You can have a good guy doing bad things for a reason. Like, I think Brian Danielson probably does it better than anyone, right? Um, people could say that he, like, flips flops since he went to AEW, that he's healed and he's faced and he's healed and he's faced. He never changes. He is always Brian Danielson. Yeah. But like when he feuded with Hangman, right? And he's meant to be the heel. His whole thing is I'm the best wrestler in the world. And to Hangman, if you think you are, you have to prove it to me. You have to prove yourself to me. So that makes Danielson the bad guy. Then he wrestles MJF. And the story is the same thing. I'm the best wrestler in the world. All that changes is that with MJF, Danielson, rather than saying, and you, and if you think that you are, you have to prove it to me, is when it came to MJF, Danielson, and I'm going to prove it to you. 100%. That's all that changed. Well, it's, that it's, character it's, is the same. It's like- it's the same with Booker T. Booker T would say, like, the only difference between him as a heel and as a baby face is that when he's a baby face, he would smile when walking to the ring. And this way, like, you can, it doesn't have to be just black and white. Like, if you can tell a story with it, you can have so much more to it than just that's a good guy and that's a bad guy. Bret Hart, when he was you know, in Canada, but it, oh, or a face everywhere else, but a heel in America. It's not that he was doing a turn every week. It was just that his character was, I hate America. I hate American wrestling fans. I hate what you stand for. I hate what you believe in. Yeah. Why can't you be more like the rest of the world? So when they're in America, they're like, well, we hate you because you hate us. 100%. When he goes to Canada, he's He's not changing his character. He's just like, oh, thank God I'm not in America anymore. You're the better fans. And they're like, he likes us. We like him. Yeah. But then people go, oh, it's shades of gray. And like I said before, no, it's not. It's just having a character that isn't just I'm the good guy. I'm the bad guy. 
I have my own beliefs, my own values, my own morals. Mm -hmm. So that when I say these things, full circle of our conversation, you believe them. Yeah. When Brian Danielson says, I'm the best wrestler in the world, you go, yeah, probably. Yeah, <laughs> like not going to argue. But like, do you feel like if someone's supposed to be portraying a heel and they go and get baby face reactions, like I've said it before, like I think Adam Cole is probably one of the worst heels in professional wrestling. In the last oh, yeah, he's, he's, like, he, he's, he's cool. He, He's he he's the coolest motherfucker in professional wrestling. He's like Adam Cole, baby. If you're getting the crowd to chant along with you and to do your boom and all that other bullshit, you're a face. Like he is, he is, and that's just like, and that's where like you can just go with something as simple as, I mean, again, it it you could argue that it's the similar thing to Danielson, where his character is the same, and the things he do he does changes, right? You know, maybe because you could say, because the elite were all heels, they grab their friend and go, no, 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 we're doing this stuff. So he's being Adam Cole, but he's doing healy things because he's corrupted by his friends or whatever, right? Yeah. But now that he's on his own, he can stand on his own and go, no, actually, that's not what I stand for. This is what I stand for. This is what I value again. But I think that that's a good example of someone who was trying to be a heel, but it's like, you're a baby face through and through. And now that he's just being a baby face, it works. A hundred percent. But you know what? I feel like now he, he'll embrace it. He'll get a much bigger baby face reaction as well. But then like you can watch him wrestle and he'll still do like kind of cheeky things because he's just because he's the baby face doesn't mean he's like clean cut, you know, baby face. He's still mm. that dick that heel Adam Cole is. But that's the but same as. But that's the same as like Eddie Guerrero. Like even when Eddie Guerrero was a babyface, like he'd still fucking cheat and stuff like that. And that was what like the fans found most endearing about him. Eddie's a great example of exactly that. Nothing like he definitely did like ebbs and flows and the character evolves and whatnot. But that's where like you could say that of all the things that Eddie Guerrero as a character values, telling the truth, you know, people, you know, not stealing and playing by the rules were not things he valued. Yeah. Hundreds. Family, friendship, sure. Competition, yeah. maybe. But that man, whether he was a, a heart of gold or an evil guy, he would lie, he would cheat, and he would steal and wouldn't lose a wink of sleep over it. A hundred percent. But I feel as well like when that you can be one of the performers that can be such a compelling heel and completely turn you, the, the audience against you and then go back to being a baby face and getting that full support from that crowd from a crowd is like is one of like i feel like you've seen guys like over the years like even triple h like yeah he's been heel mainly but he's had little baby face runs but it's like yeah, he, he it wasn't really his baby face shit wasn't really moving the needle right like it's not like he's not going to be known in 30 years time for his amazing baby face run no. Um, but like, I feel like you look at some people that can be amazing heels and then also be amazing baby faces as well. And then really sort of dive in deep into that and get that full on hatred once they've gone and turned from a baby face to a heel and vice versa. I think it's because a lot of the times, like you want it. Yeah. You know, like, and it's where like, it's the same thing for like a face, right? Like eventually the crowd want to start booing them. Mm. So then you can flip them and it's the perfect thing. And it's the same with a heel. You can have like um, the peak, like amount of heat, right? But if yeah. you turn them the very next night, the crowd would erupt for them because the reactions are there. They're booing them because they're engaged and entertained. And if you then ask them to cheer for them, that investment is not gone. No. They just go, oh, we can cheer him now, finally. And they'll erupt. Yeah. I mean, I, I think as well for like you can sort of like and and it's sort of seen over the years when you sort of see someone who is going to either turn either way and you can see the crowd sort of slowly, like if the storyline's been told right, and even sometimes it's just an organic thing where like the crowd can either turn one way or the other. Like the Usos is a good example, right? Like at Mania, they were the heels. They were booed 100%. out of the building. Crowd is a hundred percent behind Sammy and Kevin. But the minute that we get to an angle where we're going to tease that maybe the Usos might portray Roman, that crowd is so behind them. But then in yeah. the very next segment, when they're back to being heels, they're booed out the building again. 
But now that they've finally turned, when they did turn, that crowd erupts because they're booing because they want to cheer. They're booing because, like, we hate that you're, you know, being such a dick because we want to love you. Yeah. And then when you finally open the door and say, all right, let's do this, everyone floods through. Yeah. Rather than it being like a, I mean, it also works when, like, someone's just not working as one. So maybe we should flip this. Yeah. But, like, if the only time you think someone should turn is because it's not working, you're probably going to, like, you know, hit dirt more than you're going to hit gold. A hundred percent. A hundred percent. But I think like with what they did with Roman and his sort of stuff is like for the longest time, he was struggling as a baby face to really resonate with the majority of the crowd. And it's like, soon as they turned him heel and it's like putting Paul Heyman with him, I think was probably the greatest thing in the world. Cause I think Heyman is the greatest talker in the business. Like, well, it's a perfect example. Like we all like everyone wanted to boo him, but we were never allowed to. So some did, some didn't, but the minute he said, right, boo me. That whole crowd went up. All right. Happily. Yeah, so they fine. did. 100%. And now he's one of the most hated heels in the company, which he's, he's obviously done the right thing, man. But, uh, man, I just noticed we've been talking for an hour and 35 minutes. And, you know, this is not a surprising, bro. I, did, I knew this conversation was going to be one of those ones where it's like we're going to hit record and it's going to go to like, and it, like a strange amount of time. And I've just looked up at it. Um, but dude, like, I feel like we need to get you back on the podcast probably a lot sooner than than two years. Um, so I definitely want to get you back on down the road. I think like maybe even bringing in uh, Zuko for one with you because I feel like you guys could have a really good chat about this and and break down a lot of stuff if you can, man. Yeah, absolutely, dude. Yeah, too easy, man. But uh, look, where can everyone find you on social media? What have uh, have you got coming up show wise, and uh, where can people check out those shows or get tickets? Absolutely. Um, on Twitter and Instagram at dusk eternal underscore and Facebook just at eternal dusk, uh, Edward dusk, uh, ballroom brawl MCW next weekend. Uh, the biggest show on the MCW calendar is sold out, but you can still catch the replay on July 15th on fight, which you can grab. And then, uh, August 5th, I'm back over in Adelaide for Wrestle Rampage. Uh, there's the second annual Conque- Conquest tournament, which is um, eight wrestlers in a one-night tournament. Um, tickets are still available for that and will be up live. Uh, sorry, well, not live, but up on their YouTube channel after the event, um, which would get announced closer to. Uh, but, yeah, that's what I've got going coming up in the next few weeks. And yeah, that, the main one is obviously Ballroom Brawl. Um, a chance to wrestle for the MCW Championship, especially when it's held by Buddy Matthews, is an incredible opportunity. 100%. Um, so yeah, and the card itself is pretty ridiculous, especially for a Rumble show where like you kind of tr- tend to try to take it like a little easy, you know, because yeah. you've got everyone that's going to come out and do the Rumble later in the show. But um, the card is looking incredible. But, yeah, so it's sold out, unfortunately, if, you know, people around the area want to try and get in on it. But you can still stream it on Fight um, after the event. There you go, man. I think it's uh, definitely uh, where everyone should be going and checking out, man. Um, you know, some amazing shows there. And definitely go and follow Edward Dusk on all social media. Uh, give him a support. And uh, as always, guys, make sure you go and check out our sponsor, sleeps.com. Use that promo code MWAPOD uh, to get a 10% discount on your final purchase. And as always, this is the greatest podcast in the world, Shooting the Shit Uncensored. And I am your host, the truth, Piers Austin, Edward Dusk. Man, I appreciate you being on as always, bro. And uh, let's make it happen again soon, huh? Uh, Thank you for having me once again. No problem, man. Take it easy, guys. Peace. (laughs) 